Starting up, turn with me to Psalm 18. <clears throat> Psalm 18. And uh, last class, we did Psalm 57. And Psalm 57 was really the beginning. It was the beginning of uh, training for David. But more than that, it was the beginning of something glorious for the kingdom of God, even though it didn't look like it, even though it appeared nothing like it. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you remember, the inscription, the inscription was uh, when David went to the cave, Abdullah. <coughs> And so here was this psalm written all about this beginning and this beginning of these 400 outcasts. What we're going to deal with now is the end. We've got, we've got the bookends. All the story is written in between. Psalm 57 is the beginning with all of the story written in between. But Psalm 18 is the end, the other bookend at the other side that's going to close the whole thing off. And it's going to give us a comparison of the beginning and where this whole thing has ended. So let's just start by reading the inscription above Psalm 18. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul, and he said, okay, and so it's about to go into that psalm. Keep your place here because we're going to be coming back. But let's go to, now remember, last class we started in Psalm 57, and it led us to what book of the Old Testament for the historical part? First Samuel what? 22. Okay, that was the beginning. Now we're going to go to Second Samuel 22, and we're going to find the ending of this. Okay, in 2 Samuel 22, verse 1, and David spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Folks, that's basically a direct quote of the inscription of Psalm 18. Now, <clears throat> where do you find this? And, just so you'll know, basically much or all of Psalm 22, I mean, uh, all of uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel 22, all of 2 Samuel 22 is basically Psalm 18. Okay? Um, it's also in Psalm 108. Psalm 108, 1 through 5 have these verses from this. And then in, uh, also in Psalm 57, 7 through 11, it has quote from this. <clears throat> but what we're going to see here is that uh, as it says, this is what David spoke to the Lord in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hands of Saul. <clears throat> okay, And in chapter 23, if you'll just keep your place here, but just look over one chapter uh, into chapter 23, uh, beginning in verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Okay, now listen carefully. That's not what the way it described it in 1 Samuel 22. It described these 400 as distressed and in debt, complainers. Amen? This is the last words of David before he dies. And, and you get that in, uh, let's see if I can, let's look at uh, the first verse of uh, 2 Samuel 23. This is just before we get to the role of David's mighty men. Now these are the last words of David. Well, that ought to say it right there, okay? These are the last words of David. <coughs> and David says a few things here 
And then he begins, and, and you would think his last words would go any number of places, but his last words begin to describe these disgruntled outcasts, these people who were rejects, but now he doesn't speak like that anymore about them. He says, this is the role of my mighty men, and these who were outcasts and these who were rejects have become the, the warriors of the kingdom, the, the, the standard bearers of the kingdom. And David is finishing out from 1 Samuel 22 to 2 Samuel 22, and he's, he's putting the last chapter in. And uh, <clears throat> let's say I wrote in, the, in chapter 23, this is David's last gathering of outcasts that had become mighty men. And it is as if in all of the things that he did, in all of the influence that he had, that something in his heart said, this is my final words, these are the mighty men who have stood for the kingdom all these years and have represented it. And as if to say, what we started in the cave has ended to be the kingdom of God, the true kingdom. Because remember when Absalom raised up, a whole lot of people in his quote-unquote kingdom went and followed Absalom. But not these guys, not the role of his mighty men. They didn't do it. They stayed with David, more importantly, more importantly, they stayed with what they perceived to be the kingdom. And that's just huge. This is what a, what a huge reality pertaining to this psalm. So we're not going to read Second Samuel. We're going to read Psalm 18 since it's basically a quote of the other one. There's only one thing. Psalm 18 adds something at the very beginning that, sec that 2 Samuel 22 doesn't have and that the other places doesn't have, and it's these words. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. This is his final words, remember? It says that after this is quoted, the final words of David. I, this is no longer in the cave. This is these mighty men gathered around him. This is his death. This is maybe in his mind a, fine, a final uh, impartation, but more importantly, a final communication to the heart of these men and to the nation about these men that have stood for the true kingdom of God. And he looks up to heaven and he says, because it says these are the words the, that David sang to the Lord. I will love thee. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Okay. If he's going to say, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength, who is he going to be referring to? The rock. Next verse. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And so, uh, <clears throat> David <clears throat> is now communicating his love for the Lord, how God has been his rock. This, you, you remember a couple of classes ago, I think you guys might have missed the class on the rock and whatever. So, in fact, in fact, I would say the majority of you missed the class on the rock, but it was just powerful to begin to discover the Lord in a true way, the rock of our salvation, not relating to salvation from hell at all, but finding, uh, finding the true meaning of the Lord, our rock, the, the rock of our salvation and what all that means. And this scripture is bearing that out. It is the last words of David. And when David looks up to God, he's not saying, thank you for saving my soul from hell or thank you for saving us from Egypt. He's saying, thank you for being the rock of my salvation, 
relating not to hell, not to Egypt, not to any of that stuff, but relating to being his strength in his own weakness that God is, has been his rock and his shield and his fortress and his high tower. And so he's closing out his life and he's not, he's not waxing eloquent here. He is speaking from a place where he has learned these things. They have become real in him, not just to him, not just real to him, but real in him. And, and in his last words, let me tell you, when you're dying, your last words are not going to be uh, some garbage, you know. David is speaking from this place that says, Lord, you have been this to me. You have been this in me. You have been faithful. And I remember 1 Samuel 22. And I remember the beginnings found in Psalm 57. I remember the cave. And I remember where we were. And I see where we are by your strength, by your hand, by your beauty, by your gentleness, by your all the substance that is you. I will love thee, O oh God. And let me tell you, to my knowledge, this is actually one of the few places, to my knowledge, now you can correct me if you find something different, to my knowledge, this is one of the few places in all of the Psalms where he just flat out says, I love you. Check it out. Check it out. You would think it would just be full of it, wouldn't you? But it's not. And where does he use it? The end of days. The end of days. He began to realize all that has been, uh, all the credit where it goes, all of the place that you've come, to God be the glory. All that God has accomplished when you know what you were in that cave. When you know what you were in that cave. And maybe other people couldn't see on the inside of you, but you knew what you were, and now you know what God has made you. And so um, it, when he says, the Lord my rock, it is the rock that fills the weak one. And we used many scriptures, but Psalm 31, 2, Psalm 42, 9, among many, many, many that we went into during that class. <clears throat> the actual grammar here, when it says the the Lord is my rock and my, the actual grammar is the rock, my strength, the rock, my strength. When he says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength, the Lord is my rock. It's really saying the rock, my strength. <coughs> um, verse three, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy. He's, you know, because you, 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 you realize where you came, where he brought you not in yourself, not based on you, and then you will say, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy. I, I'm not worthy. It's the Lord that is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death come past me, and, and floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Um, he's speaking now in a certain sense in the past. The sorrows of death come past me, past tense, E.D., the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. But in my distress I called, past tense. It but, in my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God, and he heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him, even into his ears. So he's not just, uh, I, I am sure that David was still having trouble on his deathbed. Okay, I'm sure that there were still persecutors and stuff like that. But I believe that what he's experiencing now is, if you know you're going to die, you don't care about the persecutors. But what you do care about is, when they did these things, I called upon the Lord. I, uh, uh, when the sorrows of death were around me, I did look to the Lord. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And, and it's a wrapping up of that lifestyle, I believe, is what he's doing here. Uh, I wrote, ungodly men is literally the floods of Belial. And uh, the sons of Belial, if you go through the scriptures, you'll be amazed. If you have a King James Bible, you go through the scriptures and find out how many times it says the sons of Belial have made up lies and testified as if they were true men and true witnesses. The sons of Belial went against David. They went against Jesus. They went against on and on and on and on. You will be utterly surprised at how oh, trial after trial, the sons of Belial stand up and bear false witness and say, this is true, and we know this to be true. Uh, um, and he's so literally when it says ungodly men, he's saying not just the sons of Belial here, but the floods of Belial. Um, and then verse 7, uh, 6, starting in verse uh, oh, 5. Let's go to 5. The sorrows of, of Sheol or hell compassed me about. The snares of death were round about me. In my distress I called, past tense, upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him, even into his ears. And here again he doesn't say like we say, well, God just heard me. He says, God heard me out of his temple. That's his habitation, and we are his habitation. And, and we wonder why God doesn't seem to answer prayer. And God answers prayer. But God answers prayer in line with the way he set these things up. And he set it up that we would be his temple, not just people in distress calling out uh, in need. The earth, um, <clears throat> verse 7 then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was angry. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured coals. Uh, devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And um, uh, I believe that that's a picture of what happened at Mount Sinai. I believe that, that these people were judging based on the law. They were judging based on the law. And when you come to God with the law, guess what? He shows up as a, yeah, scary, as an as a awesome, fearsome person. And, and he came down, it says. But look how he came down, see. Um, verse um, 10, thank you. And he rode upon a cherubim and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him was dark waters, thick clouds of the skies. Um, the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and vanquished them. Then the channels of waters were seen and the foundations of the world were laid bare at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. <clears throat> Let me just say here, up to that point, darkness is part of it. I wrote, darkness is part of it to bring men to their need. Not, you're not bringing them into the truth with all of this. You're bringing them into their need. The law shows you your need. The law shows you your lack. And all, that's, that's the whole purpose of all of this. Uh, all this came so that, as we see in verse 15, the foundations of the world are laid open and exposed for what they are. His light and lightnings and bright flashes show our darkness and it shows our fears and from that, we either run from God or we run to God. <clears throat> um, let's go to let's see, verse 16. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me. Now it's changed subject. It's not talking about them and the law. It's talking about David's relationship. And he sent from above. He sent from above and he took me. Okay? 
and he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. Remember how he started. I will love thee, O rock, my strength. They were too strong for me. They came upon me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. Um, he brought me forth also in the in, into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. And I wrote, um, now David includes himself in the storm, but from his enemies. They are bullies. They come on you in the day of your calamity. You know, folks, it's one thing for a mighty warrior to come against you when, you know, when you're at your peak. Um, the other day... Um, Oklahoma's quarterback, who won the Heisman last year, uh, got hit and went down. And they said, well, he'll miss two games or more, but he'll miss two games. <clears throat> and I thought, you know, I, you know, Texas and all that kind of stuff. My thir first thought was, I don't want to play a team in their weakness. I know others do. This is the way I was, I think, before I met the Lord. I don't want to play a team in their weakness. I want them to have their best, and I want, to, I want us to have our best, and let the best team win. Let's, you know, let's not just work off of people's weaknesses. And uh, so, you know, I thought, you know, of course, two games, they could end up being out of it by then. I mean, they only lost one last year, didn't they? To, yeah, I think they only lost one to Texas. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, you know, now they've already lost one, and he may be out for two years or two games. Anyway, um, and then verse we'll start in verse twenty. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath He recompensed me. Folks, He's not talking about personal righteousness in the sense of He deserved this. He's talking about I didn't deal with them the way they dealt with me. Okay, now that yes. That's, but that comes from the life of the Lord and oneness with the Lord. Uh, verse 21, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Um, have not wickedly departed. Folks, that doesn't mean that we don't fail. It means we don't wickedly depart from God. There's a difference between failing and, and just Going with wickedness. Big, there's a big difference. Um, verse 22, for all his ordinances, and if it seems like I'm going fast, this thing's got 50 verses, and we've, you know. <laughs> okay. um, for all his ordinances were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. Folks, he's not talking about in a present crisis. Remember, he's talking about what he did his whole life from 1 Samuel 22 to 2 Samuel 22. He's declaring his lifestyle. He's declaring the way he has proceeded in all of these different circumstances. Um, verse 23, I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. <laughs> Amen, anybody? My God, there's times you want to reach forth and just, you know, whatever. Whatever's in your wicked little heart like mine. What, right? But I kept myself from mine iniquity. I could have. But I didn't. I, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I had the Lord tell me one day, I, I don't know if I told you all this or not. And it wasn't that long ago. He said, um, he said Randy, it's okay that, that all this stuff comes up in you at times and you get upset and you say, well, if they only knew what I would do this, da, 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 and you say all that. And he said, it's okay to even go. Uh, it, it used to kill me that my mind would even think that. And he said, it's okay because you never go there. But he said, here's the, here's the important thing. When they stand before God, and I use that example, but when they stand before God, I'm going to show them that you weren't ignorant of these devices. You could have done it. You actually thought it, and you didn't. <laughs> and I went, oh, because I never thought that, you know. I mean, it just would kill me that even a thought would come up, but they do. But David said, I have kept myself from mine in iniquity. Carolyn?
kill Uriah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, it's just, it's, you know, he's kept himself from that. It's, it's, that's the earth of the heart. That mm, that's good. Keeping himself yeah. in the Lord. He kept himself in the Lord and even from his own failures because you're going to fail. Every one of you are going to fail. The deal isn't failure. The deal is that you keep yourself from that, meaning that if you fail, that you keep yourself in the Lord, that that's your identity. Yes, no. <laughs> And if we don't, if we, if we go into depression and we leave the Lord, then I don't know that those things come to pass. I, I believe that your heart has to just, as much as you can, stay with the Lord, no matter how bad you mess up. Get back with the Lord, you know? All right, verse uh, 24. Therefore hath the Lord compensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight, with with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the perverse, thou wilt show thyself opposed. Meaning, folks, apparently how we treat others is how it's going to come back to us. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will br excuse, excuse me, but will bring down the high looks. I remember when I, when I read that. Uh, what is, how's, how's the wording of that about uh, if you exalt yourself, you'll be brought down and that, that God humbles those who exalt themselves? And I thought, you know, it doesn't say the devil does. It says God, God, in other words, God becomes your enemy and I don't want God to be my en enemy. That's the deal. Uh, for thou wilt save the afflicted people. And, you know, you can unafflict yourself. I mean, you can go afflict back, <laughs> you know, and then... He's not going to save you because you're the afflictors, not the, uh, you're the afflict, you're not the, uh, you are the afflictee, not the afflicted. But we'll bring down the high looks, for thou wilt light my lamp, the Lord my God will lighten my darkness. Uh, he lights my lamp, I am darkness, for by thee, he said, for by thee. Clearly, David is not looking to his own attributes, but does not go out and violate God's principles. He's not looking to his own attributes, but he won't go out and violate God, the principles of his life. Uh, God gives him hind's feet to leave, leap over a wall, and that's in verse 33, shortly after this. For by thee I have run, notice verse 29, for by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God I have leaped over a wall. That's verse 29. As for God, his way is perfect. See, that's, he's not looking. He's not saying I'm perfect. <laughs> but he's saying I'm with the Lord in this whole thing. <clears throat> um, going God's way is proved and perfect, and if followed is a shield. His way is perfect. He makes my way him, which is perfect. Okay. Uh, as for me, uh, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proved. He is a shield to all those who trust in him. And that's the deal, folks. Most people are trying to trust in God to be a shield without letting him be this kind of shield that he is. He's a shield to the afflicted. We, we want God to deal with those who are causing the problems, and when he doesn't do it, we rise up and take it into our own hands, and we've removed ourselves from him being our shield. For who is God, save the Lord, or who is a rock, save our God? <clears throat> um, verse 32, it is God who girdeth me with strength. See, it is God. And maketh, it is God who maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon mine high places. He teacheth my hands to war. And uh, the thought came to me, you don't have to apply this to this, but the way the lamb wars is that he lays down his life. And you have to be taught how to war that. I don't know, I mean, you can be taught to be skillful with a sword. But you don't have to teach somebody how to use a sword in the sense of 
you know, stab that person. But you have to be taught the lamb or you don't get it and you won't get it. <clears throat> um, what is that verse? He, 34. Um, this is how we get the victory. The bow of bronze, which is judgment. Um, he teaches my hands to war so that a bow of bronze is broken by my arms. And I thought that was interesting, how that might be broken by the lamb. But anyway, thou, thou also hast given me the shield of thy salvation in thy right hand, hath held me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. I mean, this guy's laying on his deathbed, and everything he's saying is, everything, he's saying this, everything I've gone through has all been the faithfulness of the Lord. God has been there, and he's been the life, and he's been the strength, and he's been the support, and he's been all this, and I've lived it as a lifestyle. You're not going to be able to say that on your deathbed unless you're practicing that now. <clears throat> um, verse 35, thou hast also given, okay, verse 36, thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip, because he said many times my feet almost slipped, but you delivered me. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those who rose up against me. And I believe, I honestly believe that that does happen. I believe, I believe it, I believe it. I believe that God turns the circumstances. I believe he prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies, folks. But I believe that that comes after the lamb, okay? All right, well, 10 more verses. We're rushing madly there. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemy that I might destroy those who hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them. Basically, he's saying, I have you. They cried, and there's none to save them. Even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out like the dirt in the street. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the peoples, and thou hast made me the head of the nations. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. And folks, ultimately this is a prophetic word. It's Jesus speaking these things. Ultimately. Okay. Um, as soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The foreigners shall submit themselves unto me. The foreigners shall fade away and be afraid out of their close, close places. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock. Notice how he's kept the theme from verse 2 all the way through. And let the God of my salvation, not salvation from hell, not salvation from Egypt, rock salvation that we talked about in, in the, one of the last classes. It is God who avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those who rise against me. That's the resurrection. It has to be. If there's a death, there's a resurrection. Um, what did I hear recently? Uh, the best place to, to ex the best place to see resurrection is in a graveyard. We don't want to be in a graveyard, but that's, you know. Um, Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David, and to his seed forevermore. And let me just make sure if I didn't leave anything out here. Uh, thy gentleness hath made me great. Greatness is defined as gentleness and not intimidation. Uh, I shall be lifted up above. That's in Christ. We are lifted up above this in Christ. David is being pursued by King Saul but has, because it, be, it says, you've delivered me from all my enemies and King Saul. David is being pursued by King Saul but has believed, uh, but, has, but David has believed Samuel and God that he is king regardless of how things look. Verses 49 and 50 are quoted in Romans 15, 9, saying Gentiles are part of this kingdom. They're literally quoting this, saying that. And um, I'm just going to close with this. Uh, in verse 50, Nisi and I were talking during the break. Actually, she was sharing with me. Uh, it says, Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David 
and to his seed forevermore. And uh, she, was, she had made the statement in class that there's a difference between being the anointed and being one. And she gave me another example during the break. She was talking about Joseph. Joseph had a, had a, a vision, a dream given to him of God that you will sit on a throne and they're going to bow down to you and all of this stuff. And he saw all that and immediately everything went bad from there. And he spent years in prison and he spent years in bad situations and stuff like that. Because he was, uh, the, and she said that the coat of many colors could represent the anointing. And that just being anointed, just being called is not enough. That once that calling, once that vision, once that anointing has come, then God's going to begin to prepare you. And remember, David wasn't in position, he wasn't king when 1 Samuel 22 happened in the cave. But now at the end of this, great deliverance giveth he to his king. And he's saying, you fulfilled everything that you meant. You, you fulfilled it all. I spent, I spent years on the run. I spent years uh, being prepared. And he says, he showeth his mercy to his anointed to David and to his seed forevermore. And there's the contrast. God showed his mercy to him in giving him that vision and in calling him and saying you're going to be a king and anointing him. And God showed him greater mercies by making him one with him and making him his seed. And that's, you know, uh, one of the names that's used for Jesus over and over in the New Testament is, in the Gospels is, they would say to like blind Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, thou son of David. Thou son of David. That seed is ongoing. And yeah, I mean, obviously Jesus was before all that, but it's the seed that matters. And ultimately, it's not your calling. Ultimately, it's not the prophecies you've been given. Ultimately, it's not even the anointing because you can be anointed. And how many of you have known televangelists, people that were anointed and they were doing great things for God that you don't even hear of anymore. Okay? And they're gone because they failed and everything is gone because they depended only on the anointing. God brings you, God gives you the vision and then takes you down a road like Joseph, like David, like Paul, takes you down a road that he's going to make you a king. He's going to make you this so that when the day comes, you'll rule with wisdom and you'll rule with honor and you'll rule in a right spirit. Then oneness has come and you are strong in the Lord, not in the Lord's stuff. You're strong in union with the Lord and in the power of his might. Father, we ask you to just seal this word in fact the last two classes that the bookends may hold the whole picture together for us and we might see the beginnings of a weak and frail young man not very old at all probably not even out of his teens in first samuel 22 and then we see him years and years and years and years later old and dying and yet his heart is full of joy and full of love to you father and he's seen the fruit of what you promised he, he recognizes the path wasn't what he thought it would be, but it brought him into it. Father, help these things to work in us in practical ways. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.